Uh, can you can you hear me at the back? Yes. Oh. Uh, so can we start now, please? Uh, oh. Uh, I'll probably need to apologize in advance. I, I think I'm coming down with, uh, is it a flow or a cord? I have no idea, but I, I think I'm, I've, I've never really liked Cape Town uh, like in winter. I know it's not yet winter, but it's, uh, yeah, so my, I'll, I'll try as much as possible to, to be audible, but uh, yeah. So I was, I was telling a few guys um, earlier that, that we didn't realize that question one is actually already a part of the assignment, but I didn't realize it, and so I will not, um, post my model solution up until the, a day after the due date at least, anyway. Uh, has anyone managed to, or did anyone manage to solve question number two? Lab Yesterday, the lab exercise, sorry. As a bounty, I mean, we're not giving out, well, $5,000, but, but I will buy a domain name to the person that will provide a solution to that question. So I'm, I'm, I'm well, I, We'll buy a generic domain name, right? It dot org or it dot com or something, if you're interested. Um, I'm I'm, obs I'm obsessed with that because, like, a few. I don't know if it's years now, but some time back, I, I actually did something similar, but for a different country, right? And and I realized as I was poking around uh, the taxation system in South Africa that, so payee is actually computed differently here. Um, the six bands. In, in comparison to the four that I'm used to, back where I come from. Um, and I, I just thought it would be an interesting you know, problem to solve, a reward problem. I mean, we, we are tired of solving hypothetical questions, I suppose. So if, if someone can, comes up with a solution, just let me know, and then we will buy the domain, right? <clears throat> OK, uh, other than that, are there any questions with regards to what we've done so far, what we did last time? Does it make sense? Did you manage to reuse, uh, because that, the, that was the whole point of the exercise, right? Did we manage to reuse uh, function one and function two uh, within function number three? No. Yeah, but why not, right? I mean, <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry? Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, you did that, right? Yeah, that's that. I mean, that's that's the whole point. That's what we were looking for. We weren't, we weren't really interested in. So the implementation is simple, right? It's it was very simple, straightforward. Uh, we, we, we were trying to we we're trying to see if we could we could better make use of those two functions within you know the final function that we're eventually evoking, right? Either through the use of like variables assigned to uh, the result of evoking the first two functions or, or just evoking the functions within um, the final function itself. Was it, what, what was so difficult about doing it for those of us that did not manage to do it? Oh, and I was sitting next to him. You know what happened yesterday? We sat with him, right? I didn't ask his name. We sat together with him and this is very, it's embarrassing but we'll say it anyway. We, we sat down. And, and we spent almost like almost an hour, right? Well, almost 30, 45 minutes trying to figure out what was wrong with his code. And we were debugging, right? That was like basic debugging. We were debugging, but we finally figured out that the problem was, well, he figured it out, uh, that the problem was actually um, that the, the Boolean flag that he was using was outside of the first for loop, um, but it was supposed to be inside. What I, what I normally do, and, and I think, I think I showed this to him. What I normally do when I'm faced with this problem is I, I, I completely switch to a different, a different space and then I redo everything, right? Uh, it, it normally works. Uh, so it's, it's much faster for me to re-implement, if it's a simple problem, to re-implement a problem rather than you know, spend time debugging it. Yeah. Plus, I al almost always avoid using um, Booleans. You know, it can be conf confusing to, to figure out if, uh, if x F, X and Y, or B, not, or and, not C, is, I don't know if it's true or false, right? Sometimes it can be confusing, but, but yeah. Okay, so can we start now? Is that fine? Uh, one other thing, I was, I was uh, so I was, I, was, I was talking to someone and I was, uh, I was asking them if they know why the programming language is called Python. Do we all, do we all know why it's called Python? 
It certainly, it certainly has nothing to do with a snake, by the way, but I'm sure there are, there are people who know why it's called Python in here, right? We know. I, I was sitting in this class, sorry, this is the last story. I was sitting, <laughs> I was sitting in this uh, research methods class the, the other week, about two weeks ago. Uh, it's a postgraduate, postgraduate course, and, and so Hussein was, was, was uh, teaching us you know, some, some basic fundamentals, and at some point he asked how many people had watched Monty Python, and it's then that only the two of us had watched Monty Python, right? And I, I realized afterwards that, that it's, it's likely that you know, the two of us know how to program in Python. So the name Python actually comes, the guy who um, actually implemented the language says he, during the time he was doing that, uh, was obsessed with Monty Python, and so that's where the name comes from. So it has nothing to do with a snake. It's just <laughs> you must watch Monty Python, right? I mean, I've never, I've never really been a big fan of um, British uh, comedies, you know, but, but yeah, so it's, it's like, so debugging, right? So we, we, we kind of, we now have like a firm sense of what, you know, what sort of errors we could potentially run into. Right, and, and, and it's very easy to identify them. That's easy stuff. Uh, we know what a logical error is. We know what uh, a syntax error is. We know what a runtime error is. And we've discovered that, that it's the simplest of them all is possibly syntax errors, right? Because all we have to do is follow the rules, right? Right, so but, but there comes a time when, you know, when, when, when we get to implement you know, complex, complex programs, and it's, it's, not, it's not really very easy for us to pinpoint exactly where the errors are or what the errors are, right? And that's, so that's where debugging comes in. That's where debugging becomes really useful. Right? So it's just a, a process of uh, finding errors, right? Bug tracking, as it were, right? And there are, so there are various techniques that are employed in different applications. Um, some classic examples, if, if there are those of us who use Android phones, I use an Android phone, I've been using it for two years now. You notice that there are certain apps that will, that will prompt you to, to specify whether or not you'd want to send uh, a crash report, right, to, to, to the people who implemented the program, right? Um, so what you're essentially sending back is just a stack trace of whatever errors uh, went wrong when the program crashed, and then the, the programmers or the people who actually maintain that that piece of software or that uh, application will actually be able to get a better sense of what exactly happened and then they'll be able to fix the problem, right? Uh, web, bra web browsers also do that. Uh, I don't know about Windows, I haven't used Windows for a very long time now, but I know um, it's, it's fairly common for um, most Linux distributions, right? Uh, so if your program crashes, you have the, the option to actually send through the crash report, right? But when, when, so we, when we are programming, they're, they're actually pre-built tools that we can, we can use to, 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 to actually de debug our programs, right? Um, and what, 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 a, what a debugger essentially does basically is it enables you to, to step through your piece of code, you know, stepwise if you want to, and you can specify breakpoints at which, you know, the debugger will be able to, to stop and prompt you to, to sort of like initiate some sort of interactivity and be able to appropriately debug your program, right? Wing does that. <laughs> Um, but so back to the basics, we realize now that, that we've, we've actually been implicitly debugging and, and, and in fact mo most of us perhaps know that we've actually been debugging. So when, when, we, when we're running through, when, when, we, so we, when we run into, let's say a logical error like, like it happened yesterday with, with a gentleman right there, uh, what we did, what we ended up doing was we were, we, we were essentially commenting out pieces of code and then trying to print out uh, uh, so variables or Boolean flags to try and see if we'd be able to get the, the results that we're expecting, right? So it's, it's basically some form of de de debugging as well, right? Um, I was going to give a demo uh, with, with Wing, but I figured it would be best done as a lab exercise on, uh, on Wednesday next week. Probably the first question, it should probably just take us about five, maybe 10 minutes to do this. Uh, but so Wing has, has, has this uh, option for you to specify breakpoints. Um, if if you're, you're really interested in debugging the, the code that you are currently working, working on, right? Um, so you, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can actually, uh, when you specify your breakpoints and you start the debugger, what the debugger does is it, in a stepwise fashion, it goes through line by line trying to uh, determine whether or not there's a potential problem with your code. So for instance, if, uh, 
um, if, if there's a potential that, uh, if, you're divide, if you're dividing two variables and there's a potential that you might run into uh, uh, a divide, so a runtime error as a result of divi di dividing an integer value by a zero, then we will be able to, to specify exactly where that is taking place and uh, optionally provide potential workarounds for doing that, right? But besides that, there's a, so there's, there's a couple of other things that we can, we can actually do, right, to, to explicitly you know, tell the Python interpreter to, to provide us with verbose output that we might find useful, right? Uh, a classic example is the import module, right? Um, so as an example here, what, what this piece of code is doing here in line one is we're importing the, the, the login module, right? You can try this out. Uh, if well, you should try it out, actually. It's always a good idea to try it out. Don't just, uh, so it might, it might seem easy and straightforward if, if someone is talking about it. Um, I've found in the past, and this is just me and probably a few other individuals that I've spoken to, I've found that life becomes relatively easier if you actually get to practice more with these things, right? So reading doesn't work. You, you actually have to you know, get your hands dirty. So you need to, to, to take a hands, hands on approach, right? So you can, you can uh, line number one is importing the, the login module, right? And what the login module does is it, it, it actually enables you to, to specify um, explicitly a, a file name to which you'd want the, the Python interpreter or your program to actually output uh, uh, more potential errors or warning message, you know? Um, so what's happening in line number three here, there's obviously supposed to be like a try statement before the accept statement just as an uh, account is on. What's happening here is we, we are saying that if in the event that, so we are, we are anticipating uh, an exception error, a runtime error, and we are saying that in the event that an error occurs, what we want the login module to do is to log that error, right, to a file that we've uh, obviously specified here as y.log. It's pretty straightforward, right? But as an option here, um, I, I, th I thought it would be important for us to, <laughs> to point out that you could actually achieve what we are doing here with the print statement, right? Remember we mentioned that the print statement actually has uh, optional parameters, right? So besides the, the separator, uh, the, AC, the ACP uh, and the, uh, what else is that? Is it the end uh, parameter? Python, um, the, the print uh, method also comes with a file parameter, optional parameter, right? And what that does is it accepts um, an input stream, right? So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm, um, um, and again, when we look at file in input output, we we'll actually get to understand what's happening here. But what, what I'm doing here is, in line number two, is I am, I'm telling Python to say I want to create a, a stream, right? Um, and I'm creating this stream by opening um, a file called y.log, right, in write mode. So if an exception happens in line number one, what this print method will do is it will just log this, this message error into this file. So I'm essentially doing, what I'm doing in line number two is exactly the same thing we are doing in line number four, except that uh, the logging mode is actually a lot more flexible in that it allows you to specify the, the type of error level that you want to log, right? If it's an error, if it's uh, uh, a, a warning message, if it's an informational kind of like uh, message that you, are, you want to echo out, if, if you, you are debugging that particular program, right? Are we okay with this? You must, you should try out the print method with this option, good to know. So there's, there's actually, it turns out that there's, there's actually different different types of, um, of, of testing methods, right? Um, and I think from a very high level, we could potentially just you know, uh, break them down into, into three main groups, right? There's, there's obviously maybe a couple more, but they, they would ultimately fall into these, these three categories, right? Um, so at the lowest level, what, what we actually end up doing is performing what they call unit tests, right? Is that a question? Oh, no, okay. So the, the, the lowest type of testing that we can perform is actually called a, a, a unit test. And this is, this is done on uh, individual code components or code constructs, right? And, and we know by now that the, the, the simplest possible uh, well, code component constructs, uh, construct that we can come up with is what? A function, right? So we have functions, right? Uh, 
we're not really looking at uh, classes, but you can actually build upon functions and build your classes, right? Your classes and your functions will form modules, right? Your modules will form packages, right? And then your packages will form, ultimately form the program that you might, or the application that you might be developing. So let's say as an example, we are uh, implementing an application, a web-based application in Python, and it's possible, by the way, a web-based application in Python that, uh, let's say, would want users to, to make use of if they want to generically compute whatever ta taxation uh, uh, result that they're interested in. We would, we would obviously create individual functions, right? Those functions would probably fall under classes, and would slot all that, all those uh, code constructs within our modules, right? So the .py files, right? You could have several of them, right? It might be possible that you might want to structure your code in such a way that your Python modules are in packages, right? And then ultimately all that becomes your application, your web-based application. Has anybody in here ever done any, uh, they should be here, any complex type of programming using, using Python, like web-based programming using Python? There's a web framework called Django. Uh, it makes life a lot easier, so you can literally easily uh, create web-based application using Django. And incidentally, the, the computing department runs of, so cs.ucd.ac.za uh, actually run, runs off a content management system called Plon, and Plon is implemented purely in Python, right? So just to give you an idea that we're not doing this just so we can write simple programs that we can type you know, in, in Wing, you know, we are, we are doing this so that, you know, when the time comes, we'll be able to, to write complex applications, right? Could be a web-based application, could be a utility application that you can use on the command line. All right. And then, so we, we also have integration testing, right? Um, and, and so this is, I think this is easily explained by the, the, uh, the, the first question that we looked at in the lab exercise yesterday. So what integration testing essentially uh, does is it makes it possible for you to, to kind of like uh, test the relationship between um, uh, two different uh, interfaces belonging to two different functions, right? So as an example, if we had uh, a function palindrome and uh, a function palindromic prime, the integration testing that would occur here would, would involve us testing you know, whether or not evoking uh, the function fx palindrome from within this function works as desired, right? So that's an integration test. We're testing the function interfaces, right? Um, and then finally, uh, so system testing uh, literally involves, uh, you know, the testing of the entire application that you might be implementing at that time, at that point. Right? So going back to our taxation example, if you're creating this web-based application, once you're done implementing this application, uh, the, so the, 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 the regression tests that you would otherwise perform on the application as a goal are what we call system tests. All right. Right. And so this, this brings us to, to a very important thing that we need to bear in mind, right? The fact that we, we, we must always, you know, rigorously test uh, these, 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 these programs that we are writing, right? But then in most cases, it's not really possible for us to, like if, if, if let's say, assuming we are performing unit tests, it's not really possible for us to, to comprehensively test all potential inputs that a particular function, for instance, uh, takes in, right? So uh, yesterday, I, I sat next to a gentleman who already had an implementation for his for question number one, and he, he was trying to figure out why, why his, so why his, his methods were seemingly not uh, outputting what he was expecting. And it turns out, so he was checking for numbers between 800 and I think 1,000. But it turns out, when we did, when we did our test, it, ten, it turned out that there actually aren't any uh, prime numbers within that range that are also palindromes, right? So what I'm saying here is it's, it's not possible for us to check, let's say we're checking um, palindromic primes, we're try, trying to check if there are pri palindromic primes that exist we, we are between one and a million. It's, it's not feasible for us to check, you know, it might not be feasible for us to check those input, input values or ranges that exist within, that, um, within the range one and a million 
because because there's a lot of numbers there, right? So the the techniques that we can use to actually uh, pick out the most relevant boundaries that we can use to perform our test. Right? I never realized that talking actually results in my mouth being dry here. <laughs> Okay. Now I figured out the, the joke with, with me sucking here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so so one of the things we can do is we can we can actually use equivalence classes, right? And what happens here is we we actually get a chance to to test to test values that we're interested in in specific categories, right? And and separate them from from potential erroneous values that we could we could feed we could feed our function. Back to our add function. Remember what we were doing when we implemented our add function? We we actually discovered that if we if we, we evoke the function with with two strings, it, it, it actually gives us an output, but that's an error, right? So the two strings that we're feeding our 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 add function is a classic example of erroneous erroneous values for, for, for that particular add function, right? Another technique involves us, you know, pulling out uh, boundary val values from the potential range of input values that we have, right? Um, and so the easiest thing for, for one to do here is to, so if you have a range that you want to test, right? Um, and I'm, I'm guessing there's an example here. You should probably use an example. If let's say we have, uh, uh -huh. Sorry, context switching here, briefly, because we want people to understand, right? So we have, let's say we're checking um, a condition, right? A conditional statement, and and we're, and the book actually has a classic. I remember this because I was reading it uh, just last night, right? The book has a classic example of computing, so trying to 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 figure out if uh, a, a a potential value that you are feeding to to a mark, right? We don't have to program this, right? Let's say we want to figure out if uh, if a mark, uh, let's say 15%, is is an A plus, uh, is an A, a B, you know, is a is a D or an F? I don't know. If if a potential mark is, you know, you know when you when you get when when you get marks between zero and 100, you can classify them based on based on the range that they fall under, right? So let's say we we are we, we are trying to we're trying to come up with an application, right? That tells us uh, whether or not a mark falls under these four categories, right? We know that an A would pro pro potentially fall between 75 and 100. A B would obviously be uh, 60 and 70, maybe. Um, a C follows on to the range before that, right? But but let's say we wanted to to to, to write. To, we wanted to figure out what sort of boundaries we could get here. The easiest way to do it is to 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 realize that. The potential range of values that you have for between what? Zero and a hundred, right? Right. But your potential erroneous values are what? All negative numbers, right? So anything that is less than zero is not applicable. No one gets a negative mark, right? This is what we are saying here. So we get we are we are putting out boundaries. We are saying that we, we get above so we get on boundary values, on boundary values, right? And then we get below boundary values, negative values. And then we get, for this example, we get above boundary values, right? Everything above 100. Right? So this makes it a lot easier for you to, to determine what sort, of, what sort of range of values you can use to test. Right? So if I got a 73, I know that if, if, if I already have a test case that I've used to test a value that falls between 0 and 100, I know that the, 70, the 73 will actually work for this particular application, irrespective of what happens, right? Because I've already tested the potential. I've already tested a, a classic case from there that uh, lies within the boundary that I'm interested in, right? Are we clear? Is this making sense? Okay. So, but but there, there are also times when there are also times when. Uh, it becomes really difficult, especially when we start writing complex programs. It becomes really, really difficult, extremely difficult for us to, to actually uh, just uh, rely on boundary values and equivalence classes, right? And what, what, what we would otherwise tend to do there is use uh, two techniques. 
So this is uh, path testing and uh, system coverage. And what, what we tend to do here is with, 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 path, with path testing, what we are doing basically is identifying the potential paths that could more. So if we have, we have a program, right, that has an if-else statement, as opposed for you checking individually the, the potential output from, from, the two, from, from the two code blocks that fall under, uh, under the if and the else statement, what we could do instead, or what we should do instead, right, because the potential range of values that exist there is, is a lot, right, what we should do instead is just check the individual paths, right? So we make the assumption that if we check uh, path number one, which is the, uh, the, the, the if branch, if that works, then the assumption is that obviously uh, there's a high likelihood that anything else that passes through that branch is going to work, right? So you're testing the two paths, right? System coverage, on the other hand, um, basically just involves you testing um, a statement uh, one at a time here. So there's an example here as well. Okay. So when, when you have... Um, so an another way of looking at um, testing here is, is, is by really classifying, classifying the potential tests that you could conduct into what they call black box, black box testing and glass box testing, right? So what we're doing with, so with, with black box testing, what we're doing is, is trying to, to really test the functionality of, of the program without bothering or without having to worry what the, internal, uh, what the internal implementation details are. So remember what we were doing with the math.square root function here? We don't, we don't care how it was implemented, right? All we know, all I know, or all we know is that if I feed math.square root with the argument 25, I know the result is going to be 5, right? If I feed it 100, I know it's going to be 10, right? So I'm not... I'm not really interested in, in debugging the internal code, but just uh, looking at the application of the code that actually does the implementation for the math.square root from a very high level externally, right? Gla glass box testing actually does the opposite, right? So you're interested in the, the internal uh, implementation details of the code that you want to test, right? Um, and a, a good way of, of, of actually remembering what these two things do here is just to to think of it this way. If, if you are making use of, of, of something that you didn't really have uh, um, a significant role to play in with regards to implementation, in all likelihood, what, what you'd end up doing is uh, conducting black, bo black box test testing. Yeah. Um, what form does the automorphism The what? The automorphism. Our assignments, we upload our code. Yeah. yeah. Checks black box testing. Well, I mean, obviously, so Hussein is then I wrote the automark, and I'm guessing when, when something goes wrong, um, and if he you know, gets his hands dirty within the code or the automark, he's actually doing glass box testing there, right? Right. So here's the thing, right? So now that, so now that we, I think now that we have a better sense of what black box testing is and what glass box testing is. If we were to classify what, what we just spoke about here, if, if we were to, to ask a question uh, with regards to what equivalence classes and boundary values are, how, how would we classify this? Is this, when we're coming up with our equivalence classes and boundary values, what are we doing there? So we're not, so remember what we, we, we mentioned about boundary values and um, test cases? We actually have actual inputs, right, that we are feeding to something that we've already implemented, right? So it's actually black box testing, right? So you, uh, so let's use um, an example built in function like the math.square root, a famous example here. If you want to test that, you have your input values, right? Right, and all you're interested in is trying to compare 
what you already know as the, the ultimate output with what is generated by the function, right? So what we're doing is black box testing there. Path coverage. Yeah. So the rest are basically gla glass box testing because we are, we, are, we are really looking at the code here, right? I think we, we really need to, to kind of get a sense of, uh, this, this is probably slightly important, we need to get a sense of how, how to come up with appropriate test, uh, test, test cases here. Uh, so a, a test case is, is basically a combination of um, an input value and a corresponding out value, uh, output value, right? So that's, that's your test case, right? So what we're saying is that whenever we are, we are performing our tests here, what, what we actually end up doing is, is, is uh, Beforehand, when you're when you are testing, let's say uh, an ad function that you've implemented, and you want to test if if you, you want to test what the result is between one and two, as the simplest case to see if your function works, you already know that one and two is three, right? But what you're doing is you want to see if your program is actually going to give you something that corresponds to what something that corresponds to what you've actually already have an answer for, right? So what we're saying is that. Your program does the actual, it does the testing and outputs the actual result that you'd be interested in. And then the, the manual generation involves you pre-computing the results manually, right? Okay. I think this, this probably works, works best by, uh, by kind of walking through an example. I think this might, might make some sense, right? So we, we are implementing a function that adds positive numbers here, right? And we are saying, so this is, this is a very crude example because we know that if you feed it strings, it's, it's, it's obviously going to return something that we don't want, right? So we could probably have added to, to make it uh, more, slightly more viable, probably would have had to check if, if the number is either, either a float or, a, or an int here, right? So we'd have uh, two additional Boolean conditions here, right? to check if the numbers are actually numbers and not strings or, or booleans. What is the result of adding true and false? True plus false? We tried. Sorry? What's true plus false? Oh, my God. <laughs> you, you, no, this is serious. True plus false, so, true plus false is true. We're, we're guessing now. So the thing is, I know someone knows the answer here. You, you, you can never, the only, the only way you ever get a Boolean result if you are, is, is if you apply a logical operator, you know, either to a Boolean expression, and that's for the unary operator not, not is an unary operator, right? Not true is false, so it's, it exists on its own. Or alternatively, if you apply two Boolean expressions, if you apply a logical operator to two Boolean expressions, plus is not a logical operator. Last I checked, it wasn't anyway. Believe it or not, two, pl two plus, uh, and this is really interesting, right? This, this will shock you. Two plus, this will shock those of us who don't know. Those of us who know probably won't be shocked here. So what do you suppose true plus true is then? Sorry? My God, you're not getting it, is it? No, you're not, you're not getting it. What's, what's force plus force? Thank you. So we figured it out. Right. OK, so we're saying that, um, so these are some of the things we should pay particular attention to, right? If, remember what, what she, she taught us when, when when we're looking at Boolean expressions here, uh, it's, it's really, so it's, it's very easy for you to come up with your, you, so you don't have to master your truth table, uh, but the trick when it comes to Python actually is to, to remember that there are certain, certain things that may not necessarily be Boolean uh, expressions that tend to work in, 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 in conditional statements, right? So if, if I say if, if I say if, if none, I know that none is false, right? Or if I say if, if uh, a what? If, uh, uh, what, what do we call this? Uh, what, what do we call, I'm, I'm forgetting things here. What, what do we call, uh, 
what do we call this? An empty string. If we say if an empty string, we know that that is what? Thank you. Yeah. So that's that's the only trick. You just know, I need to know the truth table and, 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 and remember that there are, there are certain non-Boolean expressions that actually tend to work, you know, as Boolean expressions implicitly. Right? So something to, to remember here. All right. Okay, so an, an example test case here. So we are uh, let's let's do it. It's more exercise here. So we are we are implementing add uh, pause function here. What what do you suppose are the potential? Let's just uh, list some some potential input values here, uh, just randomly here. What, what what sort of potential input values could we use to to test this thing? Yeah, zero three zero and three yes, uh, zero and negative one. Um, I was expecting a no because negative one is not positive. I, I thought most of you were engineers in here. But uh, so zero and one, uh, three and three and zero and three. Sorry? Yeah. No, no, no. So what I'm saying is, so it's, it's a two-step process, right? What, what I'm saying is when we're coming up with test cases, it's a two-step process, right? So we're saying the first step is we need to so we, we need to identify potential uh, uh -huh, potential input and corresponding output values, right? That, that's what I'm saying. So what does it do with complex programs when it's impossible for you to work it out? Please, someone help me here. Because we've mentioned it. Boundary values and what? Equivalent tests. <laughs> his, his question is, because I was saying that, the first step is we need to come up with what? Input values and corresponding what potential manually generated output values, right? But he's saying is it wouldn't be feasible for us to, to to do it manually for all potential values, right? And I just said that that is the reason why we utilize what boundary values and equivalent classes, right? So that you you pick out the relevant so relevant test cases that fall within the boundaries that you're interested in testing for. Could you give us an example of? Uh, I don't Yeah, then I mean, if if you're not sure, then you, you know, actually, it probably wouldn't really be uh, necessary for you to con to, to come up with te test uh, test cases. This is usually applicable to 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 problems that you 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 and and it's it's normally the case, by the way. And I, I, I don't know about your example. It's normally the case, by the way, that you almost always already know what is going to come out of your implementation. Because, for instance, if you are implementing complex programs, I mean, you go through a process, a rigorous process of, uh, you know, um, uh, ooh, collecting your requirements, right? Right. So you get if you are, so if I if I tell you to say I want you to implement a program that would like to compute uh, pay tax. I already know what the result is. Remember the calculator I, 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 I gave you as a link in question number two? That gives us an idea as to what sort of output values we are expecting, right? Of course, in the certain real world problems that might be slightly difficult, but it's almost always possible for you to manually anticipate potential output that you'd get from, from a problem that you're working on. Can I t tell you about the, uh, sorry, quickly here. The, I just remembered the tax, the tax thing. So I, what, I, what I've been doing is I've been experimenting with something. Right? I, I run a blog, it runs WordPress, and I've been experimenting with something. I've been trying to figure out how, I ca how it can be self-sustaining, because I, I have to pay money every year. Um, but I've monetized it in a way, and I generate some, some income from, from it, but it's not sufficient enough. And I've been trying to figure out what sort of what sort of things I can blog about so that I attract more people to visit it. And, and I, I did something, and I'm bringing this up because of the taxation. It just reminded me of something. So the, I, I implemented something in JavaScript, something similar to question number, number two. And you won't believe it, more than 70% of the traffic that comes through actually comes to that, to that post, right? Which is really interesting. I just remembered about it, 70%. <laughs> 
Swimming percent of the traffic. But they don't, there are people from back home and they don't click, they don't click the ads, right? So I, I don't generate any money from there. But so how how we how we actually so how how we actually go about it is is two ways. So it's stepwise, we, we first of all compute the the input values, potential input values and corresponding output values, right? And then we execute the program that we have implemented. And then we, we feed the program with the pre-computed input values from here, right? And then compare the input values that we fed our program with what we expect, what we've manually generated, and with the final output that our program spits out. So this is that. If all our test cases pass, then we know that our function works. If something goes wrong, then we can go back to our program and fix, and look for the error and fix it. All right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. This is a. Uh, and what error is, does this program have? He's already figured it out. Is there an error with the program? Sorry. Quickly, uh, we are done. this is the last thing here, but uh, uh, is there an error with the program? Sorry? Sorry? If it, no, 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 I mean, I mean, is there, my question is, is there, do you think if we were to run this, it has nothing to do with test cases, is that it has something to do with what we did before, right? What happens if we run this program, would it, would an error occur? He said, because he pointed out that there's nothing after the return statement. Okay, fine, fair enough. She, the, the lady, the kind lady, is saying we we need to to evoke the function here, right? And we'll copy it so that we we see that it's. Uh, and we've been trying, we've been desperately trying to make sure that the things that we use in here, the examples that we are using in here, somewhat. Um, Correspond with some of the basic concepts that we've we've had here. <laughs> I I think that it's a it's, it's a. So I was kind of I was kind of I, uh, I was happy at some point when we were doing a lot of context switches because there were times when I would hear people. Like I'll cite an example. There were times when I would hear people say this, you know, what he's doing is he's, he's checking this, this, and that. And to me, that was a sign that people are following what we're doing. But it turns out not not everyone actually follows. You know, there are people who prefer to, to you know, for us to actually print this on, on a slide and to walk to walk it through. I thought when I was a student, I thought it was a lot more helpful for me to have something, some sort of gadget, and be able to test the things that someone is saying in front of me, right? Because that's how this thing works. Right. Uh, so it, uh, another question: Is there an error here? Be, I'm, I'm, I'm asking because he said that the return statement has nothing here, and, and I'm asking: Is this going to work? It, it will work. It will Thank you. That's what we wanted, right? What we're saying is that there's nothing wrong with with this thing. Sorry, A is not defined. We need A and B here. Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> okay. and, and people are, are learning here right? because they, they reminded us that the function invocation had no arguments until it gave us a runtime error. Right? You notice what's happening here. It works, but it's actually a useless program. It doesn't print out anything. It doesn't return a value, but it works. Are there any general questions here? We, we are going full out with... Uh, data structures, which should be really interesting. We'll, we'll actually start looking at uh, uh, tuples, lists, uh, sets, and we'll, we'll basically look at four, four data, data structures. So tuples, lists, uh, sets, and dictionaries, right? Uh, it should get slightly interesting. But what I want to point out is before that, that will only make sense if you understand how functions work, because the, the majority of things that we'll actually end up doing in there is evoking or making use of functions that are a part of those different, those, those four classes there. Tuples, lists, uh, sets, and dictionaries. Are there any other questions, people? At least watch one Monty Python uh, episode. I think it's, that's, that's all. Good luck with the test. Uh, 
I, 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 I added an announcement to mention that the test for part three is going to cover everything we've done on functions, but there will be no, nothing on testing. Uh, but I just wanted to say it out for those of us who don't check Vula, right? Which is we should. Oh, sorry, another question, right? An Easter egg before we go. Uh, do, do, do you know how many uh, built-in functions there are? What? Sorry? I, he's saying 33, those are keywords. We're talking about the built-in functions. You know, you know, you know the, uh, you have, you have got to see this uh, for those of us that are interested. What we're saying is that, do we know, do we know what, what the, do we know what the fundamental difference between this and, and this is? Do we know what's happening here? Do we know why, why the first function doesn't require us to? Yes, so my question is, do we know? Aha, uh -huh. I, I don't know, right? You know, you don't have to memorize these things. Uh, so I was telling someone that yeah, some, sometimes when I'm speaking to people about some of the things I do, they think that I know a lot of things, but I just understand. And if I understand, I can figure out things quickly and not be able to worry about some silly things. So I know that there's a sum, for, even if we've been stupid enough to implement sum, there is, well, we don't know if, uh, I, I don't know how sum works, you know. I don't know how sum works. <laughs> it's an iterable. But even though we've been d doing some of these things, but we know that they are belt-ins, right? Isn't this wonderful? The belt-ins. So I'll see you guys on, uh, and I'd, I'd really like us to actually revisit functions because the only way what we're doing beginning Tuesday is going to make sense is if we read functions and understand functions.